Hey, what's up guys? This is Johan and on this video, I'll be giving you my top 5 tips to keep you successful in the reef hobby. Alright guys, so this video is mainly targeted towards new reef hobbies, anywhere from that 0 to 12 month mark. Um, that's most of the times when we experience most of the problems. So this video is to try to help you guys to at least keep you guys in the hobby um, for those little new re new reef hard times. Um, also, this video, even though it's intended for new reefers, um, any experienced reefer might find this video helpful as well. And also, if you guys are experienced reefers and you have um, any other tips, you could leave them down below in the comments. Anyways, guys, let's get into my five tips. Alright guys, so let's start with the first tip, tip number five, and it's actually two tips in one, and that is being patient and doing your research. So you probably stumbled on this video while doing your research. Good. <laughs> so just like with any new thing that you may be interested in, uh, maybe it's a new car, you want to check all the new specs out, uh, maybe it's a new job, you want to do your proper research so you can lock in that um, that position and nail that interview. Um, the same thing with the reef hobby, you want to kind of know everything, not everything, but know as much as you can get into the hobby, you know, what your parameters should be, so you know, nitrates, your nutrients and stuff like that, you want to make sure it's not too high, um, your lighting schedule, you know, different things that could benefit you or different, different things that could potentially hurt you down the line, um, you want to be aware of those things. Now, the reason I kind of lock these two tips together, be doing your research and being um, patient, you kind of lock those two together, it's, you know, whilst you're doing your research, you technically are being patient. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you don't jump into anything that you don't know. For example, um, you don't want to go out and um, buy a fish and um, you don't know what the potential diseases may be to look out for those so you might want to stay away from that fish or maybe it, it's a fish that requires a certain amount of um, dietary needs for example um, like some certain butterflies only eat coral so you may be going to the reef hobby and buy some corals and everything's doing fine and then you want to get a butterfly fish and you put it in there and then it just starts eating all the coral <laughs> um, I, I kind of take those dives like I like angels so I you know may or may not get a, a angel that might eat my coral but I do know the risk so you know that's one of the things you want to pay attention to. So the main reason you want to do some research and be also be patient is you want to know the basics. You want to lay a good foundation down so that your house or your reef house doesn't tumble all over. So one of the things that I find very um, helpful to me, what helped me be successful, is look at multiple um, different sources. So and not just multiple, but about three. I usually narrow it down to about three other hobbies that I find in the hobby um, that are doing things successful and are keeping a, a reef for a long time. And and I like to look at their business card, which is their reef tank. So when doing your research for coming into the hobby, you may be overwhelmed with the amount of information that is available to you, and especially in this day and age where just about everybody has access to the internet and is trying to help try and help and put little tips in um, you may run into so much information that is just overwhelming overwhelming and mind-boggling so one of the ways I find to navigate um, this you know sea of information is find two to three but I like to see about about three mark um, three hobbyists or experienced hobbyists that um, have been in the hobby you know maybe 10 plus years and are doing doing it and you could see their what we like to call their business card so their aquarium so the reason I want to narrow it down to just two to three guys is simply because of you know the amount of information out there and with the millions amount of information out there all of it can be right and it could be confusing for one reef to be doing something and then another reef to be doing something and then you have another one and then another one and so on and so on and it just gets confusing but if you have you know two to three guys that you love to see their tank um, they're doing it for a long time maybe it's like I said BRS is an entire company that does multiple types of videos and multiple aspects of the hobby 
then um, you could just grab information only from just two to three guys so your your entire you won't be so overwhelmed with all the information that's out there and 90% of the time the guys that's been in the hobby 10 plus years um, and those three guys you're gonna choose is the gun their information maybe they may be doing stuff differently but 90% of the time the basics that they're doing usually overlap so the second part of the first tip which is being patient it kind of like I said goes hand in hand with doing your research because 90% of the time um, if you're experiencing a problem or if you're just getting into hobby you kind of are being patient you want to you know see what else somebody has done to get them to that point so maybe you know you have out here as you break out you don't want to just go out and buy something that the first person says you want to be patient and kind of watch it to see what's going on maybe um, you overfed that day or a few weeks before and you didn't real realize maybe you had somebody watching your tank and they put too much food or you know your son or something or your kid put some too much food in your tank um, and maybe it's just simple simply by doing a few water changes and just chilling out don't go crazy and buying new stuff and putting in your tank and next thing you know it has it backfires and all your coral die all your fish die so sometimes just being patient um, doing a little bit more research um, you know seeing how to get rid of the hair algae and stuff like that just chill out relax and that usually takes care of most of the problems just being patient also another part of being patient is you know this hobby you know we're trying to mimic nature and if you look outside nature doesn't really do things really quickly as far as like as far as like building stuff up like you know growing a coral usually takes about six seven years for it to be that massive big big coral that we see um, out in the wild or even a tree you know you get a little zapping that's, that's a little seed that turns into a zapping and then it before it turns to a large oak tree you know it takes five ten twenty years for it to get that big so whilst doing your research, you know, be patient. There might th be things that you may run into. Maybe it might be hair algae down the line, um, or you might be experiencing hair algae right now. Sometimes just doing something as simple as doing water changes and cleaning your aquarium. You know, if you have a sump, clean your sump out. Maybe you know you did a actually accidentally overfed your aquarium and you got all the food that was in the main display, but you didn't notice that it went over your overflow and it's now in your sump just sitting and can just decomposing in there and your schema is trying to do its stuff you know trying to take it out but you might need to just clean your sump out do a lot a good water change clean stuff out that might just take care of your green hair algae issue it might not be um, that you're feeding so much it might just be one mistake that you made you know maybe you had too fish too much fish or whatever um, but you know you want to just stay on top of stuff um, but stay on top of stuff being patient all right guys so the next tip tip number four that is to not chase numbers. All right guys, so whilst doing your research and whilst you're trying to be more experienced in hobby, one of the things you might see is your parameters should be at a certain number. So for example, pH, usually, they usually say for you to have good growth, pH should be at about eight. Now, if you have an aquarium and everything looks good, all your corals are doing fine, fish are doing fine, uh, and your pH is at 7.8, um, don't go trying to raise your pH in one day trying to get it to 8.0 um, you know by you know doing adding different buffers and different additives to try to raise your pH because you know what that's gonna do that's gonna stress your aquarium out so like I say in the first um, in the first tip you want to be do your research and be patient <laughs> so you may find while in your research that even though you run at 7.8 and other people run at 8.0 but you may find there are other people that run their aquariums at 7.8 and they don't do any additives. For example, that's how I run my aquariums. I use reef crystals, that's what I've always used to mix my salt. And um, so my um, when I mix it, after I mix salt, it's always been 7.8. When I put it into the aquarium, the aquarium stays at 7.8. It may rise up to 7.89 after a feed-in or if I do some, some something in my aquarium but for the majority of the time my aquarium runs at 7.8 now I remember when I used to start trying to chase that that high pH I started killing coral my fish start looking stressed out because you know you trying to raise something that doesn't need to be raised your aquarium is happy it's thriving as the way it is um, there are ways to raise to raise your pH um, and stuff like that but you know sometimes just leaving it alone being patient leave it be will help Alright guys, so my third tip 
tip number three that is to keep your hands out of the tank. So one of the main things that we are trying to do with our saltwater aquariums is to mimic the ocean and try to mimic ocean parameters. Now some things that we use on a daily basis are, are not natural and because our aquariums are so small in comparison to the gigantic ocean, um, the stuff that we use may not get diluted properly. So for example, things like you know, soap you know, and even lotions, those things we use on a daily basis can stay on our hands even after we think that maybe we wash our hands completely with soap and it's not thoroughly moved off our hands and um, you don't run anything like carbon and you're not doing regular water changes and that stuff starts to build up so you might have um, one way to see it is for example when you're gonna put your hands in the curve you turn off all your flow now usually there's like a slick part of the aquarium at the top of water and if you put your hands in you're just gonna see that kind of just disperse and that's almost like if you have dirty dishes and you take a drop of Dawn dish up whichever dish up that you use and you drop it into that water you're gonna see the water just disperse and it's basically the same thing so whatever is on your hands you want to minimize that one way I found of minimizing putting my hands in the aquarium is um, using stuff like these like these little tongs I found these off like this one I got off Amazon is just some Something that I could, you know, if I want to grab a piece of coral or maybe some piece of food fell into the aquarium, it's just, you know, so I could keep my hands out of the tank as much as possible. This is the larger one, I got this from like Dollar Tree, but I use this one more because it's easier to move. But using these minimizes the amount of time I put my hands in the tank. I try to limit my, the amount of time I put my hand in the tank about maybe once every couple of weeks or once a week and that's usually mainly during the water change so if it's a Saturday I'm getting ready to the water change then I know hey I'm gonna do the water change so I'll put my hands in the tank but for the most part I try to keep my hands out of the tank because you don't never know what chemicals are on there that could cause problems for you down the line or even instantaneously it depends on what um, cause that you're keeping. Alright guys so coming up at my second tip, tip number two and that is keeping things simple. So for the saltwater aquariums and reef tanks, four things that you actually need is good water, good lighting, good flow, and most of all, good filtration. Those four things that I listed um, on my top of the list, the most important is actually filtration. Um, there's many ways to do filtration, but you kind of want to keep it simple. Just maybe if you have a sump or hang on back, whichever one that you choose. Um, I personally like a sump because it gives me a little bit more space, give me a little bit more room to work. Um, in my sump, I just like to have you know protein skimmer and uh, refugium. Now I, I could just run only a protein skimmer, or I could just run a refugium. But I just like to run both of them because I get two different aspects of um, nutrient export. Um, protein skimmer takes away stuff that are not dissolved just yet, and then um, or not broken down completely in the aquarium, and then the refugium takes away all the stuff that's already broken down and into the water like nitrous, phosphorus, stuff like that. But there are different ways of getting um, filtration. So you could have a algae scrubber and then I could also have a protein skimmer and then I could also have a denitrate um, reactor and then I could have a and you could see so you can start adding things but you want to try to keep things extremely simple especially when you're new in the hobby and you don't know how things work try to keep it as simple as possible so you go filtration maybe you just have only a protein skimmer uh, you might have a protein skimmer and a refugium and I, I kind of um, think that works really well and for 90% of aquariums most people that's what they have they have a um, refugium and they have a protein skimmer so protein skimmer takes away one aspect of the nutrients right before they break down or the um the dissolved organics right before it breaks down into nutrients and then the refugium removes the actual nutrients itself another thing with um, keeping things simple is your lighting system so it doesn't matter what light you use, um, you just want to make sure that when you put it on, you set it and forget it. I remember when I first came in the hobby, we used to use T5s and even before then, they used to use male halides. Now we have LED lights and we have a little bit more um, controllability with those lights. Um, so you might, you could be able to raise your reds or lower your reds, raise your purple, raise your blue, raise your white. And um, that's cool and all doing that, but you don't want to keep doing that on a daily basis. You, know, you don't want to keep changing things. You want to set it and, like I say, set it and forget it. You know, you want to, let's say there's a certain spectrum that you want to follow from like radiance or whatever. 
whatever they grow, special is sell it and forget it, just leave it alone. And um, it probably might take about six months for your aquarium to actually start use it to start um, showing the results of that. So just set it, forget it, and leave your tank, just be patient with it. All right guys, so our oh, last and final tip, my number one tip, which I would give to any um, new refurb refurbist, especially if you're just starting off and you're in the process of doing your research, and that is to start with live rock or cured rock. Now I know what some of you might, you guys might be saying. You don't may not want to start with um, live rock because it has you know potential um, you know organisms that's on there like um, nuisance algae or there might be a, um, some kind of killer snail or killer um, worm like a bobbit worm or a um, mantis shrimp that might be on that rock. And that's why I also recommend that you start with um, fully, fully cured live rock. So the newest trend in the hobby right now is to start an aquarium very sterile with um, dry rock, dry sand, and some bacteria in a bottle and uh, put that in your aquarium and just insta site the site with your aquarium. Um, that works, that's really good, it works, but the problem with that is if you're a new hobbyist, there are certain things that you are going to run into that you may not be aware of. Um, even though you did your research, you might have missed something. And this is a relatively um, new um, process. I would think it's maybe about a year or so old, um, maybe a couple years. Um, and the reason I, I, I would kind of sway you guys away from that is the among the problems that you may have down the line with doing it like that, and you may not know the right way to steer your way out of it. So like I say, I'm not bashing the whole starting the aquarium is very sterile. It's not a bad thing. I've done it before, but it's the fact that as a new hobbyist, you may not know how to deal with those um, those different allergies that you might run into. So I know what some of the guys may say. If you use um, live rock from let's say another aquarium or out of the ocean, you may put to have the potential in to introduce different um, bits of like um, different nuisance allergy, which which is true, different little critters and stuff like that. But I also recommend that you guys start with fully cured rock. And it's the same thing as you going out, you're buying your rock right now, uh, putting your aquarium and insta cycling your aquarium. The only difference is whilst you're doing your research and you know being patient, just relaxing and finding out what you need to do, or maybe you're waiting for a bigger tank, a uh, 180 gallon tank, and you have your 10 gallon tank or whatever, or you know, you're brand new and you just want to have a big tank. And what I would suggest to do is, you know, Buy your rock now and just put in some salt water, five gallon buckets or different bins. Just let it run. You could add, do the same insta cycle, let it run for that first two to three months. And that way it do, develops a slime coat over that rock, the bacteria is right there, and that prevents algae from growing. Now, it won't completely remove the algae. Um, it won't pr completely prevent the algae from growing. The algae will grow. But the problem is the rock is not aged well enough to deal with the algae so that when you do get that outbreak and maybe you go in and you just turn your lights off for four or five days a week turn the lights back on the algae would doesn't completely take root in your rock you want to make sure that your rock is properly cycled that way you don't have any algae issues down the line so like I said, um, I'm not bashing the whole starting the aquarium with um, very sterile insta cycling aquarium. The only issue I have is, or I can see happen because I've seen it myself, is that when you start insta cycling your aquarium, you could have different allergies that will develop that could have been avoided when you first start your aquarium. So I've had this little weird brown turf stuff that I've never seen when I start with uh, live rock or cure rock, but when I start an aquarium with completely dry rock, um, I've seen it. So for example, this aquarium, when I only set up like maybe a month and a half ago, but I have live sand, live rock, and then I have two pillars of dry rock. Now on the live rock that I started off, which has been going on for a year and a half or so from my other aquariums, excuse me, um, they were fine, clean, clear. I had a little bit of heology here and there um, on some of the um, coral tips, but on the rock, it was perfectly fine. But on the brand new uncured rock, I had this weird turf stuff, and I'll make sure I put some footage of it here. Some weird turf stuff that I've never really seen. It almost looked like um, dinos, but it was not dinos. It looked like a mix between dino and um, and diatoms, a weird kind of weird mix because it had the string and then like a little bubbly brown stuff on it. So I don't know. Um, but I've only seen that 
Um, this is like the second time I've seen it. I've only seen it on dry rock that has not been cycled. All right guys, so that has been my five tips, five and a half, if you count the first one as two, um, that to be successful in the reef hobby. Uh, I had a few other tips that I wanted to mention, but I decided, you know, let me not put those in. Um, for example, um, I'll give you a six tip, um, six tip um, is to, you know, quarantine your fish. But the only reason I did not add it just yet is because even though new guys, they say they do research, but um, if you don't know what to look for in a fish, um, it's hard to um, just quarantine the fish. So uh, I personally always say quarantine your fish and that would be my number one tip. But I decided, you know what, for now, let me not put it on there. But if you think you have the capacity to quarantine, quarantine your fish. All right, so anyways, guys, let me cut this video off here. If you guys are more experienced hobbyists, go ahead and you know, put some more tips down because we try and keep as much people, new guys in the hobby as possible. Um, if you're a new guy and you have questions, comment down below. I'll answer. I try to answer as much as I, I can. And if any of the, um, the more experienced guys see your comment well, as well, they'll comment as well. So, you know, comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. If you guys like this video, go ahead and hit the like button down below. And also remember to subscribe. I'll catch you guys in the next one.